with a reported 85,000 Taliban fighters across Afghanistan now capturing over 200 of the total 400 districts and the US intelligence warning of the fall of the capital Kabul in the next 30 to 60 days, women and children are the country's most vulnerable and threatened group. At 18.9 billion, women and girls constitute about 48% of Afghanistan's total population of 48.7 million. Historically, at least in the last four decades or so, they have been at the receiving end of the country's slide into violent, medieval misogyny led by the Taliban. Mahbubha Siraj is among the strongest advocates of the Afghan women and children's rights. The 73-year-old activist, living in Kabul since 2003, having returned home after a 23-year-long exile in America and elsewhere, is deeply worried about what is to come. Although she concedes that there has been considerable advance in the empowerment of young women and girls over the last decade and a half, she is unsure of what the dramatic US troops withdrawal from her country would engender for them. In an interview with Mayang Chai reports from Kabul, Mahbuba Siraj painted a deeply grim picture of a country that has barely known peace since the late 1970s. Mahbuba Siraj. First of all, uh, Ms. Siraj, welcome to Mayang Chai Reports. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. Thank you. I was just thinking about your name and the way you pronounced it. That's what I was busy thinking of. Okay, no, it's Mayank Chaya. Mayank Chaya. Very yes, good. Chaya. Uh, in, in the last few days, you've expressed a great deal of outrage at the way the US and the West have handled Afghanistan. Would yes. you care to dwell on that? Uh, yes, I was actually. This is something that has been going on since the withdrawal of the US officially, or since the time when when President Trump actually announced that he wants to take the soldiers out. I mean, at that time, I thought, okay, President Trump wants to do this thing because, you know, because the elections are coming up and the man wants to uh, prove a point or God knows what, so he's doing that. And we all thought that this is absolutely crazy, but then the man was known for doing some crazy stuff. So I, and then the, the Democrats won. And then the Democrats won. So we were hoping that, you know, things, although nobody wanted the American soldiers to stay here forever. I mean, the Afghan people did not want that. And we still don't want that. But we thought, you know, most probably the Democrats are going to be thinking about all of this in a different way. Right. We're going to be going about it differently, and we're going to be doing it in a different manner, not putting the whole world's security in jeopardy. But of course, I was absolutely silly to think that, because that's exactly what happened. And then when I heard, and then especially because of the way they chose the date, which was September 11. And right. I'm thinking, what is, what is this? Is, is, are they trying to prove something here? Like what? Did we really beg you and ask you to come to Afghanistan because of September 11? That's why you're trying to remind us and you're doing this. What was this whole thing? September 11 was important to the whole world, but especially to the United States. And it wasn't our fault, the September 11th. So why are we paying for it? I don't get it. But anyways, you know, lately I don't get anything about the way the world is running. Right. So then it was, that was decided and that was announced. And right. then the rush. And the rush, the way everybody started packing up and leaving. I swear to you, Mr. Chaya, that the, at the end of the time, when the background Air Force uh, the background base, which was one of the biggest bases of the United States in Afghanistan, was closing. Apparently, from what I heard, about eight hours before closing, they just told the government something that they are giving out. I think some some army people, but not really, or they did or they didn't. But that's not was not. I mean, the biggest the biggest base of the United States is closing, and eight hours before closing, you are going to tell the government of Afghanistan that you are leaving. And the way they left, they turned on, they turned off the lights, they shut down everything, and they left with their plane. It was like it was like thieves leaving an area. I was like so. I looked at that scene, and I'm like, 
oh my god what happened here why i mean i mean you talk of destruction there were there were people there were soldiers that they had hammers in their hands and they were cutting the electricity the, the electrical lines and the, the connection and there were prisoners in there there were people in there and the way they left and in the in the mess they, they left in the in the yard or whatever and i'm looking at it and i'm saying okay i'm supposed to be saying this about the taliban of the world that they are doing this they are destructive they are going anywhere wherever they're going they're destroying what is this from the most the most advanced country in the world this is what's happening this is how they live why why are we getting punished all we did they asked us to stood next to them they helped us they trained our soldiers and we stood next to them and we fought did we do wrong that's what you were told to do we did that because of a because of something that honest to god the afghan men they did not know what was going on really in reality right have so, you no i was asking have have you wondered why uh, this terrible rush that you are describing i mean i mean wouldn't you want to know why i've been yeah. wondering about that i've been wondering about that since that day and i'm banging my head against the wall why why was it like that was it really necessary what was so what was so urgent that it has to be in this way it has to be done this way and at the time like now to leave the way they are leaving this area you know sir i'm not a i'm not a extremely knowledgeable person i i don't have masters and 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 doctor de- de- degrees about about all sorts of things in this world but i've lived here and i know the world and i know what is going on especially in this part of the world right. this is the time to leave it like this this is not you have to be here you have to keep your presence as to in order to have a balance in the world because what is happening we're ruining the balance again the united states ruined the balance by pulling themselves out speaking of ruining the balance during the past one week or so some nine provincial capitals have fallen to the taliban already including kunduz uh, the us's own intelligence is now saying that rather than six months Kabul could fall in the next 30 to 60 days. Right. You you are sitting in Kabul. Would you like to describe the mood what's going on in Kabul in your mind and the people's minds? <laughs> you know Mr. Chaya that we are extremely uh, uh resilient people the Afghans. They really right. are. I mean I mean I cannot tell you the resilience of the Afghan men and women is absolutely beyond belief. I mean it's well known so <laughs> really and in in the way you know we all are I I myself I am actually an Afghan American. Right. I left I, the United States. I went and sold my house in a city that I loved more than anything which was Santa Fe, New Mexico. It was not a little a hole somewhere in the world. Mm-hmm. I sold my little beautiful house because I don't want to live in that country anymore. The country that has that was my home, the second home. You know treated the world this way, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I'm sorry. that was not the country i went and i went and asked for for asylum and they accepted and they opened their arms and they accepted me that is not the that country anymore i am so sorry to say this and always and everywhere i was everything that i said everything that i did i was i was i was taking part of the united states i was behind them of what in whatever they were doing but this how am i supposed to explain this to the world how am i supposed to explain that to my own art in my mind and my soul that what happened or or we completely separate i mean people of the world are becoming so mindless and so soulless that it's not even funny anymore right right that's that's a strong yeah. indictment really uh, you know I mean, I, yeah for for you to say that you will not come back to the this country uh it, it's a strong indictment yes i am not this is all i can do as a human being as a human being with the little power that i have the smallest little amount i'm going to be speaking about it i'm going to be i beg the world i beg the international community i said for god sake don't do this europe i cannot tell you how many times i talked to them hmm. i said please don't follow the united states you're europe don't you know 
You're very powerful. You can decide. You don't have to leave us alone. Stand behind the women of Afghanistan. Give us a chance to talk. Give us a, give us a chance to be present. We love that land very much. We will not do any harm to it. But of course, they wouldn't listen to us. They did listen to us, but up to the point that it was to their benefit. Right. But, but then it begs the question, Ms. Siraj, uh, is, is, would you have liked an open-ended involvement of the rest of the international community in Afghanistan? Because it, on, on the face of it, it didn't solve a lot of problems for, for Afghanistan, did, no. did it? No, of course not. Not only did it solve a lot of any, any problems for Afghanistan, it created millions of different kinds of problems for us. First of all, the people of Afghanistan, I don't know anymore, sir. I don't know who we are. We were very, very honorable, honest, fantastic people. We were poor, but we were the, the dumbest, most honorable people. Now we are not. We have become all thieves. All we do is, is steal, all we do is lie, all we do is grab, all we do is, 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 is greed. What's wrong with us? We are not the same people, but we learned that in the past 20 years. I swear to you we learned that, because I was in every step of the way I was there watching. Right, right. And I see change. Uh, there are those who believe that this is a throwback, in a sense, to the time when the Russian-backed government in Afghanistan was overthrown by the same bunch of Talibanis. Do you think that there is any validity to that view? I really don't know how the minds of the people work, to tell you the honest, the honest truth. You know, from one side, I hear that the uh, this is a throwback from the uh, you know from the <laughs> from the, the British war that you know we fought with the Britain and right. this is a throwback with the with the Russians because we if it wasn't for us they wouldn't be kicked off and they would not the, the communism would still be living in in, in God knows what else right. is it <laughs> is that what it is I mean <laughs> I, in, in this tiny little country in the middle of the whole world I know it is the heart of Asia I can feel it. But I, I don't know whether all of this is the truth. I don't know. Uh, you, to, to come to the, the more substantive and more important aspect of my conversation with you, you represent Afghanistan's most vulnerable and traumatized constituency, women and children, for whose rights you fought for the last 18, 19 years after you returned from America. Yes. Uh, what is the general feeling among uh, this particular constituency now? They are, they are extremely disappointed. They are, they are lost. They really don't know who will be standing behind them, who will be protecting them or next to them or whatever. Uh, they don't know, my, the young generation of Afghanistan really doesn't know if they're going to have a future in this country or not. Are we going to become refugees all over again, all over the world, like Iowa became a refugee? In 1978, for the for the love of God, I do not want to leave this country even for a second. I swear to you. But we were forced, and we were kicked, and we were God knows what. But those are, you know, the changes we have seen, or I have seen in this world, has been absolutely unbelievable. But in, now the women of Afghanistan feel that. Now, 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 what am I going to say to the young girl that? that when I came to this country, she was only, uh, she was only 12 years old, and, and she was looking up to me, and she was hoping to be, a, you know, a, a leader like me or something, and talk like that, and, and all of that, and she made it, and she went to school, she went to the university, she right now stands in front of me with all of her youth and beauty, and she, and she, and she has achieved it. Now, what am I supposed to say to her? You're not going to have a country anymore. You're going to be, if you, for your survival, you should not be around here. You're supposed to leave this country and go somewhere else. Because, because in this country, you cannot. You cannot work. You cannot live. You're going to, you're going to break your spirit. They're going to, they're going to st st stomp all over your heart. And they're going, to, they're going to break you and destroy you because, because you know something. Because you're, you are knowledgeable. And your knowledge is not is not accepted by by the guys that are coming to to run this country. What am I supposed to say? You know, right. Like, right. You know, women's rights activists such as, of course, yourself and someone like Fawzia Kufi, for instance, who was shot and wounded 
you could again become targets of violence. Do you fear for your personal safety anymore? I mean, what, what is that? What is that status now? Well, you know, for Miss Fauzia Kufi, she's a lot younger than me. God I know. Her and her children. And right. I, I want her to be safe and well and, and all of those good things. To tell you the truth about me, I'm not a martyr, sir, at all. But one thing I know, I'm not going to put one step back. Oh. If they want to come and kill me, they better do it. Because this woman, at the age of 73, is not moving anywhere. She's right. staying right there and looking after her own people. Right. That's what I'm doing. At 18.9 million, women constitute about 48% of Afghanistan's population, yeah. which is about 48.7 million. Historically, at least in the last four decades or so, they have been at the receiving end of the country's slide into violent misogyny. What are your biggest fears as the Taliban returns in the immediate? You know, uh, it could be many things. Um, it all depends how they are going to come in. You know, right now, with the way I see some of the things happening, uh, I don't know what is happening. To tell you the honest truth, we d I, I don't even know that even when they take over a, 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 a province of Afghanistan, actually, the whole thing is given in their hands. So there is some kind of a game going on somewhere behind the, behind the curtains, behind the scene. Now, I don't know what that game is. But the only thing I know is the lives of the people of Afghanistan that they are being destroyed, which are our soldiers, which are which are actually the, the, the Taliban as well, because, you know, we have to look at it. They are also Afghans. They are supposed right. to be. They are supposed to be Afghans, unless there's a billions of, of Pakistanis that they have entered with them. So if, if this is if this is dead from both sides, this is not good for anybody. I don't get it. Why? Why? What is this game? How come we are we are fighting and fighting and fighting and everybody's dying and then suddenly the, 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 the province is handed over to Taliban? Why? What is this? I mean I mean I mean we are completely, completely baffled. I cannot tell you how how every single time I mean, I'm listening to the news, every single time I'm hearing the news, every single time I'm analyzing the news, every single time uh, I'm seeing everything. I'm just like, wow, really? Is this yeah. what's happening? You know, I'm mystified at the speed with which things are caving in in, in the face of the Taliban onslaught. It's almost as if people have given up and they are yielding so quickly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, again. Also, I'm, I'm wondering, like, so, so what? We have, we have armies, we have soldiers, we have all of these young people, we have people who are standing behind all, all of this, and, and they believe in it, and they wanna, you know, take part. So, what happened to all of them? What are they doing? And besides, how many Taliban are in this world, sir? How many um, are? They? I'm they, glad you. I'm glad you mentioned it because the figure that's being quoted is 85,000 across Afghanistan, as opposed, as opposed to about 186,000 trained Afghani troops. Yes. Now, President of Ashraf Ghani has talked in terms of arming civilians and yes. roping in warlords. Do you think yes. that's, that's a solution? Well, how, what kind of a solution is that? That's going directly straight to the civil war. That's going directly to the civil war. It's like it's like so. You wanna you you are going to you are going to get. This is going to stop with the Taliban, and then every single one of us we are going to fight each other again. We are going to do the same thing again. We are going to let the history repeat itself again, because we haven't learned anything throughout this whole process. Nothing was learned in all of these years. Right. So we're going um, to do it. Uh, there is some argument being made in this country where I am in the U.S. that in the last 20 odd years of the U.S. occupation, there were some gains, especially the way young girls and women managed to get educated. They got masters and PhDs. Uh, do you think that's a sort of a pushback that might uh, compel the Taliban to look at the situation differently than they used to before? Well, I mean, of course, that that could be a part of it, yeah. I mean, but but you know, 
unless I don't know, maybe they were. I don't know where they were. Of course, they were someplace without any any knowledge of the world and what was happening and how the world was moving. So I I uh, I believe, yeah, they 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 could have been, you know, not knowing what has happened and what's happening, and this could be one of the reasons because women are always a number one, you know. Uh, point of uh, contention, you know, it's like, oh my God, the women. So, um, yeah, that also could be. Uh, yeah. but, then, but then, you know, the 20 years that the United States was here and all of these women, they got educated and they are, thank God for the, for the opportunities that was created for them. Thank God and thanks to the United States for doing that. But was it really necessary to end it like this? Hmm. This is what I'm saying. That's an investment. They made an investment in this country by the people of the country, no doubt, but it was an investment. So how do you leave your investment like this? You know? This is from the point of view, business doesn't make sense. This is not even a good business. And Americans are supposed to be very good at business. Yeah. You're looking at everything from the business, you know, point of view. Right, so right. Like, it's like you're, you're creating all of this and then what happens? So this, as far as business is concerned, that's a bad business. Is there any hope in your mind that the Taliban is becoming familiar with this socio-cultural shift that has taken place since 2001 and they might position themselves differently this time? Yeah, they are. They are. I have a feeling they are. They are going to. They, they really have to. They really have to. That doesn't mean that they have changed. Mm -hmm. That is because we have changed. That is because the women of Afghanistan have changed. Right. So for that matter, I don't think they have changed a bit. But the only the other thing is that they are they are clever. They are uh, up to up to date with the technology of the world. They are up to date with what is happening in the world. So they are going to adjust themselves accordingly. I see. And, yeah, and we have changed. You've been deeply involved in the Afghan Women Skills Development Center that you yeah. oversee. Yeah. Uh, would you like to? It's also a shelter for women in distress, I believe. Yeah. Uh, a couple of things about that. How do you see its future once the Taliban probably takes over Kabul? And how do you think the center has helped young women and girls to acquire skills? Well, the, the thing is, that's one of the things that I really don't want to talk about it a whole lot because I think it's dangerous. Because all of these talks and all of these things are going to be monitored by, right. uh, by, by a group of Taliban for sure. Okay. So, so I don't want to give them any kind of an information, but sure. what, you know, against, against I understand. Them, but everybody else, no, I really, I really, I, I try to kind of not mention it a whole lot. <laughs> okay, <funny>. okay. <laughs> Uh, I mean, for all practical purposes, President Ghani is preparing for a war now. I think he has essentially written off any kind of peace talks, isn't that? <laughs> you know. President Ghani should have known that this was from the beginning, like we all knew that this was the most stupid peace pro proposition in the whole wide world. I mean, really, you think, you think, how could they, how can they, but then again, of course, I understand that they have to go what, what the world says and okay, we are making peace and of course you have to accept right. the peace and peace, peace, peace. But this was one of the most incredible, um, uh, what shall I say, uh, preparation, not for peace, but for war that I, ha I have ever since seen under the disguise of peace. I mean, I, I mean, yeah, and, 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 and the, 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 the Taliban, they made such a use of this. They are going around the world right now with different passports, with different p p p things, and, 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 and they are, they've been, um, how shall I say, uh, they are, they've all been created as, as political men of the world. They were not before, and now right. they are. Everybody listens to them. Countries are inviting them. I mean, I mean, the whole thing was so fantastic for them. Nothing for the Afghans. Right, right. Africans. So, so all of this, and, and he didn't know that in the beginning. I mean, really, really, the, the second uh, the, uh, the most knowledgeable man in the world did not know that. How come? I knew it. How come he didn't know it? All of us women, we knew it. Some of the women in Kunduz, they knew it. The women in Badakhshan knew it. We all knew it. That this is something that we are going into, into it and it's absolutely wrong. And they're using us and abusing us, and they're going to. And at the end of the day, everything is going to change to be something else. Right. 
And how come he did it? And now for it to get, and, and then the way the whole thing was, 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 was managed, this whole war, the way it was, it was, uh, it was managed. It was, it was the most incredible thing in the whole world. We were just sitting down and watching. And, and, and wondering what on earth is happening. Maybe for me, it's all of this is a lot more important because in my blood, I do have, you know, politics of Afghanistan behind me. Yes, maybe, I'm aware of that, yes. Yeah, maybe the 300 years or 400 years of, of something that brought this country to wherever is in me, it's in my DNA. Maybe I knew it, but I knew it. It's just like, but I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one. So it's like, uh, what happened? Uh, you know, historically, wars and conflicts have been a sort of a male muscular enterprise. Women generally never get involved in an enterprise like that. Why do you think there isn't a stronger pushback from Afghani women over the last four decades uh, on their men to get this over with? Because it's relentless since the 70s. I know it's, it's, it's relentless. I know that. But the women of Afghanistan, you know, they put their whole hearts and soul and all of their power into their education and to achieving something and to getting a life for themselves and to making a life for their children and to educating their children. So that's why, you know, the generation that we have today of the children growing up, they are much stronger and much more educated and better than the one before because those mothers worked on them. And those mothers, you know, brought up their kids, you know, to be the, the, the young girls and the young women that they are today. Right. So, so that's what they really did. And as far as as far as getting after their men, <laughs> I guess I don't know. That's I believe I believe that's in our in our DNA that maybe right. we, can, we cannot stand right. our men. Okay. I mean, we can stand to a point, but no. Okay. True. True. <laughs> you know, China is emerging as a likely new stakeholder in Afghanistan. Oh, yeah. It's not known for its uh, uh, wish to reform societies that it gets involved with. So what's possibly going to happen is that they'll deal with the Taliban at a practical, pragmatic level without bothering about the terrible sociological impact that it will have. Are you worried uh, that China's involvement could in fact strengthen the Taliban? Absolutely, absolutely, it will. Our neighbors are strengthening the Taliban to begin with. Sure. All of them. You know, it doesn't have to be China. China is going to enter with enter with uh, with all of our uh, you know with what we have underground, which is which is today we are the we are one of the richest countries in the world. That is the truth. We do have everything underground. So China is going to enter from that door and it's going right. to make deal with the Taliban. I'm going to get everything out of here. I'm going to give you 20 percent, 80 percent for me, and it's a deal. And then what will happen? You know, um, socially. Um, geopolitically, uh, financially, in every sense of the world, culturally, everything, you name it. In Afghanistan, that's not their concern. And they're not going to be worried about it. And I don't think I will be even alive to think about it. So, you know, right. I think my job will be done. <laughs> Just last couple of things. One is, how do you see the role of Pakistan now? Because Pakistan is obviously worried although they were the genesis of the Taliban in many ways. They are concerned at what's going on. Uh, what do you yeah. think the Pakistan Why are they now? Why are they concerned now? They should have been concerned from day one when this whole thing started. You know, why are they concerned suddenly right now? Because we started the hashtag all over the world saying, you know, uh, 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 this is why. Because now they know that the world is listening to the words of, you know, with the, with the way the, the, the social media is going. That's why they are worried. They should have been worried from the day one. If they are good neighbors, as a good neighbor, you do not want to put your neighbor in such a in such a position that that they will be the losers. Because if they are the losers, you will lose too. What do you think? You think you think today's Afghanistan is Afghanistan 1978 or 1980? Is that what you are thinking? That's not the name of the game anymore. With the Afghanistan of 1980 and with all of the, the refugees going to Afghanistan, Pakistan was created literally with the power that they have today. But today is not like that. They should have, they should have been there next to us from the day one and not fan this whole, this whole, um, you know, this whole problem. 
Mm-hmm. From day one, not give room to the Taliban, not give them, um, uh, uh, not open their arms like the way they did. Please stand with the Afghan people also understand it. Let's work together on this. Why aren't you doing this? But but the whole idea is that they, they wanna they wanna ruin Afghanistan and then they wanna take over. This is not going to happen. We won't allow it. We are all going to die for it. We really will. We will die, but we are not going to allow it. What are your expectations from uh, India generally and Prime Minister Narendra Modi particularly? You know, India has been a wonderful friend so far. But India is also doing their proxy wars in Afghanistan. Right. You know, India should not be doing that. India should think that they are really much bigger, much more, um, how shall I say, powerful and established to be doing that to us. That's not right. You know, there are still that the, the little ditzy stupid things that the way one with Pakistan and India is, is doing all of that. With India, we are, we, are, we are expecting so much more. We really are. Because hmm. the closeness with, with us people is very different. It, know, is. it really is very different. There is, a, there is an understanding, there is, a, there is appreciation, there is a, how shall I say, there is a, there is a co- collaboration, cooperation, uh, and admiration that has been going on for so many years. You know, there is a civilizational bond between the two. Really, yeah, we understand each other's beauties. We understand each other's poetry. We understand your ragas and we understand your music. We Absolutely. understand, your, you know, we understand. We understand the, the the smells of India, the flowers of India, the beauty of the colors of India. That's how we know each other. We don't know each other because we are fighting, we are killing. Right. We are you know, we we don't have anything in that level, and we don't shouldn't have anything at that level. Never. You know, in India today, uh, you know, a country that has, you know, as I was thinking of one day of going and living in a, in, a, in a Muslim country. The other day I was thinking, actually, so I, I said, you know, I really want to hear the Azan and everything. And I was right. thinking, how about India? And I said, you know, India is also a possibility. Because in that country also, I could hear the bells of the church as well as the Azan of the Mullah. Absolutely. Absolutely. To me, that's the beauty of it. And honestly, I'm so sick of living in the ugliness of the world that I'm dying for the beauty of this world. Yeah. Uh, and to, to wrap up, uh, uh, you went into exile in 1978. Yes. You lived for a period in New York, Manhattan, etc. Yes. Uh, would you like to compare 1978 and 2021? Are there any similarities at all in Afghanistan? In Afghanistan? Yeah. Yes. No, not at all. Actually, actually, I used to love the city of Kabul before, and I, I still remember it, you know, from the from the way it was. But uh-huh. even but even when I look at it, you know, from a higher uh, high rise building or somewhere, and I look at the beauty of the city, it has become a very beautiful city actually again. Hmm. Uh, it's very crowded, but it's you know, but that's the name of the game. That's the way the world is going. You know, more population, uh, but it's becoming a you know a beautiful a beautiful city. Right. But the city of Kabul for what it was in those days and when I was young and when you could walk on the streets with not even thought in your head that something bad is going to happen. I mean, in the middle of the night, I remember my, my brothers and I used to come out of my sister's home and I would put my hand in one arm and with one brother and the other brother. And we would be walking on the streets of Kabul around 2 o'clock in the morning. I mean, yelling and screaming and singing and dancing and reciting poetry and, and, and just having such a good time and walking all, all the way. And it was quite a, quite a distance. So it took us, it used to take us about 35 minutes, 40 minutes to walk. Mm-hmm. But it was it was just great. It was just the greatest thing. Uh, but now, of course, it's not like that. Right. You can't, you can't even walk on the streets of Kabul. There are so many cars, and there are so many crimes, and there are so many horrible things. And the, and and the, if, and the atmosphere yeah. is really bad because you know pollution and everything. So. If I were to ask you to end on one hopeful note or one hopeful idea about not just Kabul but Afghanistan, what would that be? Oh my God. I want for Afghanistan that the war would stop. I want for the refugees to go back to their homes and find their homes intact. I want the killing of the soldiers of Afghanistan to stop. I can't can't see them dying anymore. 
I want I want just peace in this country. We've been so tired of it. So tired of it. Because it's been so many years. Right. That's all um, on that note, Ms. Siraj, I really greatly appreciate your time. I know you are besieged these days. It's easy for me to sit in Chicago and talk to you. You are in Kabul, and I'm sure it's very tough. My absolute best to you, your family, and your country. Hopefully, you'll, you'll visit India someday. If you do, maybe I'll drop by and say hello to you. Oh, I would love that. I always visit India. I, I mean, I mean, that's a country that I, I try to go at least once or twice a year, even though lately I haven't because of the COVID and all of that. But I, I always go there. I always, oh, I, always right. I always have to see my beautiful India once in a while. You know, it's like I really, I really do. And and I and I really do hope so. Hope to see you there. And thank you for giving me the time. Thank